Hi, everyone. And thank you for attending my session. I hope you will enjoy it. And thank you for the organizers of having me in this amazing conference and being among these lovely speakers that I usually meet them frequently. But I wish next time it would be in person, which would be more and more uh, engagement. So uh, uh, I wish that you had some good sessions before mine and you will continue your day as well. It's, there is amazing topics. Uh, I wish you all the best attending of them. So this session today, uh, as you know, my name is Mohammed Taman and I'm giving this practical design of RESTful uh, or RESTful APIs or, you know, effective design. And maybe it sounds familiar for most of you, but it's always when I do code review or discuss something related to this kind of, uh, you know, uh, presentation, uh, it's always like, there is always misconsumptions or you know, uh, there is something that I or should get. Let me share my screen and show uh, just one second. So I hope you can see my screen. Any confirmation? It works. Okay. Super. Uh, so as I told you, like uh, this is an effective design of RESTful API. And uh, I actually, I will start with simple techniques, overview of what it takes to add an effective API. And then we will move on to define who will benefit from your API. And this is very important, which is participant, uh, and what they will hope to accomplish from using your uh, API. Okay, or do you, like, so do, do I have to uh, raise my voice or let me, let me try something if you feel that it's not that good. I will switch off to the microphone and I will see. So what about now? Can you hear me better than before? Super, thank you guys. <laughs> thank you for much, 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 much of confirmation. Okay, so I will say again, like we will start, we will have a goal for our development then from the requirement into the, uh, this our goal of the tip of the, this uh, mountain, which is we have to go through some steps, which is very important in order to have a really successful design of RESTful API. Because as we're gonna see, it's not just some URLs and payload and something like this. It's very important to know it. So what to know, let's go through uh, some of the, so uh, before I, I jump in to know what I'm doing daily, I'm working as a solution architect for a company called Nortel. It's based on, uh, it's Estonian company and we have like six branches worldwide. So we are doing software services and development for government for Amazon, for Google, for some big tech companies also based on the locations and working in Middle East as well. So I'm working as a solution architect for this company. Beside that, I'm Java champion and uh, uh, Oracle Ace. So I'm involved with too much with Java, as you can see. So this is something that I love. So let's go to, you can also follow me on my uh, social media or you can just easily search my name Mohammed Taman on Google and you will have all the connected social media. The most importantly that all my development and my proof of concept and my code is on my GitHub account and it's always updated to the latest technology and uh, the latest you know uh, updates from specification about trust about hate use about whatever it is. So you will get a reference implementation for all what I'm speaking about uh, about resource, response code and everything. So let's go back to our main agenda. As I told you, uh, it's we. I'm going to start with a simple overview of what it takes to add an effective API to your, uh, you know, uh, a product. This is very important. Then we will move on to define who will benefit from your API and what they will hope to accomplish with it, which is the functionality and how we can expose it. This is very important. And we will take as an example for this. 
Next, we will paper test our, we don't have to have a tools. We will paper test our API to make sure it makes sense. Once we have our API model, we will deep dive into HTTP response and payload, the most important only part to see how we can start developing our REST uh, uh, concepts. And this is very important. Late, at the end, we need to make sure that our API follow the REST constraint which is those six constraints. This is very important. So finally, we will learn about a good API, how it could be. And also it's like you are choosing your adventure book. And we will talk also about link relationship example on API without documentation, how it could be bad and this like things. So let's get down to the business and design some effective APIs. So let's go guys. Uh, by the way, I will take all your questions by the end of the presentation, so we will have to finish this and prepare your questions, and we will, uh, we will, I will take it uh, at the end. And if we miss something, you can send it to me, or the moderators can send it to me later, and I will send the answers, and they can publish it, or uh, anyone can uh, send me. I will reply him or her immediately. So before we dive in, what we need to learn how we can add an API. So sometimes we are working mostly in some type. So API design, you have to know that it's really hard. It's not that easy. Something like, yeah, let's do some API because it's very from the complexity. So you need to, to mimic those, you know, and to understand those like four points, very important when you design an API, what functionality to expose and just enough functionality, not everything uh, you think in the future, how to expose it, this is very important to avoid complexity. And then you have to revise to see the best way to expose it. Like when you are writing an algorithm, you don't just write an algorithm from the first time and uh, you know, uh, hey guys, take it like that. So you have to know what is the complexity of the algorithm, the time space, the speed, based on the situation. And finally, we always have to have peer review or something because we need to adjust and improve. This is very important points when you design API, either it's REST API, GraphQL API, or normal algorithms or functional or class, whatever it is, whenever the functionality you would like to expose. So I'm talking general here. And as you know, guys, there is only two hard things in computer science we are always speaking about. And we are always have an argue when it comes to code review. Like caching validation, this is something really hard topic and there is a lot of uh, debates about it and naming things. Naming is the key, naming is the documentation, naming is just to make you avoid a lot of like explanation what the function should do. So we will see how the proper naming will really uh, benefit us uh, in these scenarios. <clears throat> In, in computer, uh, in HCI, computer human interaction, or when you deal with something, we have something called affordance. Affordance in design means that is something which allow you to perform an action or accomplish a goal. So this is something like when you have door locker, you, what is the affordance? What is the functionality and main functionality of the door locker is to, 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 uh, to open and close the door and the handle should be properly adequate for your hand. It, should, it shouldn't be something harmful or from metal that could be rusty and harm you. It should just do enough the, the functionality in a proper way. So also same like switch, why I have to have a switch with USB and we can have many functionality while the main goal of this switch is to switch off and switch on the light, just using simple things and proper design. So affordance is always just about the functionality that you would like to think about. What does it mean here? We will see, for example, uh, affordance and practices when we design, it's like what the API allow you to do. You have to ask like, question like this and what the API makes it easy for you to do like instead of like calling bunch of APIs to complete a functionality why not to get all the data from one or two APIs in sequence or in one call so and be before that I have to think about the user what actually the user want to accomplish this is very important when you understand the base functionality that your user what they want to accomplish and what they want to do you will see how you can enhance your input about the data and the output also just enough output for him and how to make it easy for they to make use of your API. 
we love coffee and I just drink my coffee like this, like one sip. So I usually hold the cup by many places. Look, let's take a coffee cup and an example. Handles, they have handles and those handles are great. And why are we designing handle? Because it will allow us holding the cup when the content are hot, so our hands not burn and easily for holding. I can use it for hanging it in, in, in some other things. I can use it to hang it in the kitchen or some other like hangers. So this is how the design, why it's not that small because it may be a big um, mug and I don't want to, you know, hold it with my, my, my fingers. So I can have a force over this. This is the design in general. Let's apply all of this into the API. But before, let me talk about how I can add it. So we have three strategies here. One called bolt-on strategy, or we always call it brownfield. So do you know what is brownfield projects? Brownfields always when you jump in, into a company or you start working on some other project that needs some requirement, it's already exists and we need to add functionality. Sometimes we have a system and we need to enhance it to have mobile application, to have uh, another connection to integration or something. So I have to develop REST API. So how I can do this? You have benefits and you have also, you know, pros and cons. Let's see what it is. It's a brute force approach, but generally is the fastest way to get something useful because you already have a business running and you would like to get a benefit from this business. And it takes advantages definitely from existing code and system as they are going and you just adding uh, to expose this functionality through REST APIs or your final APIs. The problem is that if you have a problem into your system, it will leak through the APIs like bugs or something like this. So you have to take care of testing all of this kind of stuff. And uh, the most easiest and lovable project for every one of us is the Greenfield. The Greenfield project is the brand new project. And we generally when take an approach to, to design, we say it API first or mobile first. So it comes out of analyzing the, the, the requirement, define the set of APIs and how it interact, was it the payload, how it will take the, uh, the payload and the response payloads and exception handling, all of this kind of stuff. And then we will develop and make the contract and we can submit this contract for all the integration people or developers or front end engineer, whatever it is. And we start working in parallel. Even we can mocking, you know, we can mock it. So it's much easier for integration later on. So we have separation. Then we, after our contract, then we go to develop the back end based on this requirement because those are the requirement coming from the customer. And this is how we called it API first or mobile first. Definitely take advantages of the new technologies, possibly also give the team more time to take advantage of the new technology, work with something new. And, but not always possible to drive the business very quickly because you're starting from ground and trying to develop first the API. But if you have iterative process, an MVP, you can have it. And then EVP, uh, at the end, you can uh, prioritize your tasks. The, the, we, and then we have facade strategy. And this is really common. And I was working with some projects like that. What does it mean facade strategy? is like you are wrapping existing logic and replace as you go. But, but uh, ideal for legacy systems as an application always functional. As like I was working with pension and taxation or banking systems and they are using COPL and using, you know, uh, AS400, which use COPL and, uh, um, you know, some old system, but you cannot do integration, but they are functional, bug-free and always working. So what to do? Then we have some tools to talk to uh, COPL interfaces and then make it exposable as a REST or SOAP APIs. Then we have the integration. So it's like we are replacing on the go because we need a mobile application. You cannot do mobile development and interacting with COPL interfaces. So this is how it goes. But this is uh, when the big systems already function and they don't want to spend in rewriting the system into new uh, technologies, so we take advantage of this and we call it trap at the go. But the main problem that when you define the requirement with the people already working in these systems, you will have misunderstanding. So you have multiple mindset. You are coming from object-oriented, coming from different world, 
and they are not understanding this. They just need understand how to develop function and give you interface and that's it. So this is could be the challenge. Once we now know how to add our API to which system based on what project I'm working on, let's do modeling. Modeling is your key to success. How? Let's see this. So I would like to give you some tips about modeling. And because I hear about the, like developers say like, I have to use my, uh, you know, my tools and something. But the most general rules I want to lay out here is don't worry about the tools. Just even you can write it on paper. You know, you can have it at sticky notes, write whatever you like and during the modeling and shuffle it until you finish, then go to the documentation or Word document, make it simple. Don't let the tool, you know, I, I, I have to develop in this and Jira or Confluence and whatever, use whatever it comforts you. At the end, you will have, have it in presentation, it doesn't matter. So don't worry about this. And most importantly, to have a consistent process. I will show it to you. When you have a consistent process, you can fill the gap easily between the requirement as we're gonna have an example now. The most important and the least, but not the last, but not the least is it doesn't count unless it's not written down. How does it mean? You cannot memorize everything. When you have a conversation, definitely you will come up at the end with almost 30 to 40% of the conversation and you forget the remaining. So this is very important. Record it, write it down, minutes of meetings, ask again, don't miss the, the uh, I usually do recording if the people allows me and they have to ask first, take their permission. And also it's very important that you have to write it down. Then even just fast notes, then you can recall all the information goes through the conversation and the requirement. This is really important. And sometimes I open a task immediately. And whenever we decide, I just write it down the description and I can refine it later to make it a proper description for a task or epic or something like this. So without the computation, it doesn't mean anything and you would have a lot of gaps. So those are really three steps. Don't worry about the tool, you know, have a consistent process and documentation, documentation and documentation. Document everything and you can be prioritize everything later on. Don't wait till the end until you forget. Let's, and okay, we have, Consistent process, we know that we need to document. So how to start, from where? Definitely, I would like to start from the people who will use the system. This is very important because their interaction and their uh, main role using my system will identify the resources, will identify the verbs that we are going to do and the actions, and we will see this. So how to identify participant, for each participant, we need to capture. It's like persona in, in, the, in the field of user interface or taking requirement for UI or design. It's called persona. It's some features and characteristic about who they are. Is they external or internal to organizations? So I have to take care of the security, how they can access, what is the limit, what are the privileges, what is the access permission, short description who they are. So I, does they like to have dashboard, some specific information? They are my client and they would like to see how I can serve them. This is very important. Let's see a small example for this. So who are our participants? If we go to coffee shop, I like coffee and we always like coffee so we understand the terms. So we can say like the patron, which is you who's asking about the coffee, we have a cashier, we have barista who preparing and other customer, right? Those are our participants, nice. <clears throat> now I knew my participant, how I can identify the activities and breaking them into steps. This is very important. Let's take a consistent process here. So when I identify my participant, I would like to identify their interactions with my system. And from here, we make the link between the participants and my, uh, the system. So let's see. You place an order, then yeah, I, I'm asking for a coffee and I will wait for the order and then I receive the, the order. What do you think about this like activities? Yeah, it's short, but it could have description, but it have a problem here. <clears throat> the big problem, it's not fully descriptive. It doesn't, you know, describe what others 
really is going to do with your uh, system. It's only about you, which is the customer. Where is the cashier? Where is the patron? Where is those guys? If they are useless, why do we have to take care of them? So revision number two, which is more efficiently, this is incomplete as I told you, because it described only you. So let's try again and try to make it effective a little bit. So we have to describe like this. The patron, which is you, creates an order with the cashier. So there is some interactions. The cashier passes the order to the barista. The barista acknowledges the order and adds it to the queue. And as an order are processed, inventory and machines are tracked. Those were missing and we didn't know about them. We just knew them when we revisit the interactivity. So we will take them into account. And finally, as order are ready, they are announced and delivered. <clears throat> so now this is a complete list of the interaction between all the participants. You have to make sure of this, that all participants are already exist because you might list like 10 participants and in the end of the interaction, they end up with eight. So we don't have to worry about the two other two because they just as like some external that doesn't is not effective to the system, but they will exist some way. And the customers definitely receive their orders. So let's identify a big example. Let's take it like this, uh, a small shop for book online. <clears throat> and we will go through all the activities, identifying the participants. I just want to give you I don't know, activities. We will define the resources. We will define the verbs. And we will end up with the URIs for our APIs, REST APIs, without even going into development or something. This is the contract I'm telling you about that you can tweak. You can have it in any like document, in, in Swagger, whatever it is. <clears throat> so let's speak about our participants here. So this is like an example for you to understand the process more. Like we have system admins, we have some developers that involve in fixing system, adding features, something may, they may have a role. The customer who's ordering books and the customer support, definitely. <clears throat> okay. So what are our activities in short? We have a place order activity, lookup order status. I'm here, you know, we have the participant. We know how to capture the participants. These are activities, the main activities. Anyone can do it, like, and we will attach them. So we can place an order, look up an order status. We can cancel an order, add an item to a cart, remove item from cart, and clear cart and checkout process. Those are the main functionality that we would like to focus on. So, Let's say create and group API methods. What does it mean? It means that now this is a different step. So let's see the process that we are going through and what is the consistent process that we should understand that we have to follow. First, as I told you, we have to identify a participant, then identify activities and revisit until we describe everything. Later after this, when we have activities means break it into steps like how we will see this. And after that, create an API definition based on that. After that, the final thing is always validate your API, which is testing and it goes revised. And to see if there is any gap, missing requirement, we are okay, we are serving all the requirements or not. So those are the five steps that we should always go through. Identifying participant, identify activities for those participants, break them into smaller activities, and then we can create the API definition. Then we see, hey, is there is anything missing here or missing requirement? Are we filling all the gaps? Super, here's our contract. Let's continue. So now let's review, identify participant activities just to look at over it. We have those participant for participant and those are our activities that we will take care of them. Let's now know how to create an API definition identify the resources. The resources are usually the nouns in your requirement. So do you remember item resource? We have item, we have item to cart, we search for item, we, you know, so item is a resource and it's a very important resource. So we can list items, view items, search about items and add edit item. This is how we group. So we group the, the nouns that we are working on. Then we have another resource, which is cart. What you are going to do with the cart, the activities for that cart based on the requirement and the activities that we have identified, we add item into cart. We can remove item from cart, clear, view, check out. What else? We have orders. 
So what we can do, list orders for customer, obtain order status, and then cancel order. And finally, we have customer resource. What customer does here? He, we can view the customer, we can search customer, and we can edit and add customer because they need to interact with the system. So this is helpful for the customer support to see what is the order of the customer and he can edit or add himself or edit his information. And customer support also can search for customer to help them through their orders. So those are the resources that we can take out from our activities and list all the verbs, which is the sub functionality over this customer, uh, these resources or those resources. Okay, I will, I have three questions here for get and skip activity for the online bookstore. Okay, we will review it. the payment. The, the payment, uh, someone asked, Max is, asks about the payment system. I, this is a very small example about, you know, the booking I cannot cover. There is a payment, there is a notification system. There is a lot of things that we can speak about, but for, for this, the sake of, uh, you know, this presentation, I cannot get into because there is more inventory and there is like tracking system you know, big system, but I'm just taking only the cards and interaction between the customer and the card and check out. Once check out, for me, this is final step, just to make it simple, because if you like to discuss it, we need three sessions. So let's now map our activities to nouns and verbs. The nouns that we have as a resources and verbs here are the functionality that we have but we need to map activities to a resource life cycle. What is resource life cycle? What does it mean, the activities? It means that take this, the, uh, the discovered action to map it, the, this action to HTTP nouns and verbs. What are the HTTP verbs? The normal ones, git, post, put, delete, batch, and head in, in general. So those now we would like to, to make the resource life cycle based on this activity, either the R map, like I'm going to get data or going to create data or edit or delete data. So those are the second activity or third activities. So I always lay out some table like this, I, like for one resource, like as you can see, item resource, there is some activities and then there is a verb and the noun and mapping. So let's see uh, for one, the first activity. Let me check the chat. In the resource, same are participant. No, not usually. The resource are the nouns that the activities acts upon them. So they are not the same, but sometimes the, 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 the participant could be a resource if they have a functionality, then like customer. Customer here, he can be, he should subscribe. The customer should edit his data, the customer, we can look up the customers. So there is a functionality over this resource. And then what the customer can do, he can look up for items, search for items. Ah, item is something that I have actions over it. So this is very important to identify. All the nouns, you take the nouns and you see if this noun has some actions to act upon it, it will be resource and you have to take care of it. So I hope it's clear. So um, here for item resource, so let's see, sorry. Uh, okay, we need to list item. It's very easy. I can say git because we use git for fetching data and slash items. This is very important. Uh, the naming. So I usually here use the naming convention that items, sometimes people argue like, why it's not like database? Database always have like, you know, a, a, a singular name for table name. Yes, because it's an employee. And when I have more than an employee, it's represented by records. But always here, when I always by default get, I get all the data, I get all the items. And when I would like to specifically, uh, it should be semantically agreed upon. This is the, the, the pretty much semantically agreed upon standard. It's not a standard, it's agreed upon principles that we are always generally all the API taking uh, this principle that we name the resource as a, uh, as a pooler. So yes, when I would like to always to get, I get all the items regardless the pagination of everything. If I would like to get specific item, I say, 
for the second line, get the, from those items an item with a specific ID, which is uh, the ID number. So this is how I can read it. I get the item, uh, item number one from the items collection. So this is just put it in your head as a general rule. So all the resources should be nouns. And searching, definitely we use search. Uh, we don't append like slash something. We use slash something to identify the resource. But when I use search, I use query parameters. This is very important. I don't use search that terms in the URI resource identification ever. It's used as a query parameters. And when I add item, you can have post items. Yes, I can create item. And finally, I can edit item. So if you check this, you will end up with just two URLs here, like items. Items are the same, just changing the verb will do some different actions. Item slash ID specific item. You can edit this specific item or get it. So we have here, like actually two URLs and one of them like this also the first one with some specific parameter it will serve so i end up not messing with many uris like five or six uh, resource identification for the customer and i have only uh, i can end up optimizing to have only two uri for that resource so let's do this for the cart so definitely as we understand like but adding item why I put in question mark? Because it's a mapping and relationship between two resources. So I have to identify which came first and what is the dependability based on them. We will see this. Remove an item also, let's see it. Clear cart, it's speaking about cart. So I can delete cart and specific ID. I cannot delete all the cards in the system. And view cart, I would like to view a specific cart ID and check out. Is the check out, is the process, it's a verb, it's not, something how can i it's not identification by id or something so we will get back to this because it's a relationship for the resources list orders for customers yes i can get orders specifically for by id and i can obtain an order status for that order id and uh, uh, because here someone may ask me like list orders it's not list order, it's list specific order for a customer because you know this is one order. You go to the orders and you can check them. You can have get orders if you would like to get all the customer orders. So it's up to you. But based on our requirement, I don't need to get it. I just list one order, obtain an order, and I can cancel an order. So I end up only with one URI that will serve all the functionality of the customer. Lastly is the customer. I can search customer. I use query parameter. I can view specific customer and then among other customers and I can add a customer using post. And finally, I can edit customer using put. And uh, this is how it is. Let's go back to define our relationship. What does it mean by uh, relationship and between item? How can I ident identify it? Let's see uh, those question mark, how we can resolve it. So design relationship, we have three types here, guys. So the relationship types, either independent, like database. Think if you are like understanding the database between tables, weak tables, main table, uh, master and details, this is very important. It's literally the same concept. So independent, so the resource may exist only uh, uh, regardless of the other things. So they have just interlinking. They have some more information between them. So dependent, one exists, cannot exist without the, the parent, definitely. So it will come after the main resource identification. It cannot start with dependent one and then uh, the independent. So no, it has to have an order because you identify the dependent resource based on the master one. And then we have associative. They are independent completely, but they have relationship that contain additional information to describe the relationship. So let's see a quick example. Uh, and this is a question like, can the resource exist without the one another? Yeah, I have item and I have cards. So card could be empty and item could be exist without the card. And the card could exist as an empty without the item. So it's dependent or independent. So it doesn't matter which one come first. Uh, does one resource only exist when other exist? No, they can exist both of them. But empty card, doesn't have any sense without items. 
Does the relationship between them require more information than just links between them? Those are the questions I can ask myself to know the relationship type. So let's see, very example, we love movies, but you can see here the resource, like I can have a movies and I can get the movie by ID. I can get all the actors for that specific movie. I can get all the characters played in that movie. I can have the specific character ID, uh, specific character for that movie. I can get all the actors and specific actor. I can all the movies or specific movie played by this actor. I can get all the characters that that actor has played and I can get a specific character for specific actor. You can see that characters never ever came into the beginning. Why? Because it's something that depends on the movie or the actors. So there is no character, but the actors independent. He can come at any time. He can play in different mini movies. Doesn't matter, he's independent. And the movie is independent than the character. So this is why they are independent, but the character here is dependent. So he cannot come as a main resource. It's sub resource that cannot exist without, there is no character without a story or a movie, and there is no character without an actor playing that character. So this is how the relationship could be, and this is the URI formation, how it could be. So let's get back here. So generally, yes, we say, if I would like to item, logically, I say, I have cards with a specific ID, and inside its item, I can add a specific item by its ID. And I, it's, at that time, I identified as an item underscore ID because we cannot have the same uh, um, pass, uh, parameter, variable parameters. And, and URI was the same name for confusion. So secondly, it's easy, the same URI, but using different verb and for check out, it's a process. So we call it like this, check out for specific. So it will make an action. And usually, usually actions, we use post because it's have activity and it's changing the status of the resource. Post is, is not ID important, like git ID important, edit ID important. What does it mean ID important? And if you apply the same action multiple times, it doesn't matter, it will not affect. Like deleting, if you delete it once, it will be deleted. If you apply the same delete, nothing happens. It will not change the status of the current uh, resource. So this is like very important term. Uh, in the uh, API. Finally, after like we made everything, we finished, we have the URI, we have our tables and everything. Let me uh, validate, which is very important for us. Uh, I will take your questions at the end, I will answer them. So I would like, because I have another like uh, section, very important to give it to you also. I don't want to miss it. So how to validate, just as I told you, we write each resource action on a note card, does it matter the tool, use a note card to map each flow actions, et cetera, and fill any gaps you might be missing, assign them to the resources as appropriate. Let's see an example because always example is nice. So challenging objective, what about handling a missing order? And what about to reorder the same order as the last time? Can we do it with the current API or we need to create something else. This is like missing requirement. Uh, when I was like validating, oh, how can I cancel part of an order? Let's see the solution for that. Like, oh, what about my order is missing? Simply the customer service list, the customer order. I have a functionality that can do this. The customer service obtained the customer order status. Yes, they can, I have, and I can cancel. I can check the status. So I don't have to develop anything. I already have an API to do this functionality. What if I would like to reorder the same thing as the last time? Okay. Customer views a previous order. Yeah, he can. I have an API to do this. Customer copies order. Ah, oh, this is something new. I don't have it. So I have to consider it and see how to add this functionality for orders. And customer checkout, we have a checkout. So see, Based on this one sentence, I discover a new functionality that I have to add, which is adding a new collection. Uh, Reorder the same. What if my order is missing or something wrong? Customer service list and orders. Yeah, we have such functionality already developed. 
customer service viewer an active order yeah i can obtain the status i have functionality and customer service cancel specific item means removing specific item from the cart we don't have this and we need to to add this functionality for customer service so this is when i validate i discover what is missing then i go to my main table and add the missing you know functionality and this main table can act as my contract and they can distribute it among the others we have the verbs we have everything and we can enrich it later on when we see with the response code with the payload and everything in order to have so now it's very important to understand this is the process in general how we can map how we can create an api even without the HTTP response and everything, but we have the main URI, very important. We have the verbs, we have the search terms, we have everything before we div, deep dive into our programming language and start developing. So we can validate, we can explain and quickly get all the, the URIs from the requirement. So I only going to give you an overview of what's important for HTTP for us to consider when developing REST API. So yes, it's very great tool that we have and, it, and understood definitely by most of the clients. It's layout entirely, but you have to understand REST is not a standard. This is very important. It just reads is also REST is not a pretty URLs, not necessarily XML or even JSON. It could be binary, it could be whatever the data you are return string. Uh, you know, it doesn't matter, but it whenever whenever I speak with people, they say like REST, yeah, it's URL and JSON. API. No, it shouldn't be like this. It's not. There is no standard. It's agreed upon principles. It's like not like SOAP. REST is a general, as I told you, agreed upon set of principles and constraint. You have to understand this. This is why it's always enhancing and it has different architecture and mindsets sometimes when, when it comes to deprecation, when it comes to API versioning, when it comes to security, it's based on your requirement, like SOAP versus REST. Soup is a pretty standard. You cannot do anything without following specific steps. So soup versus rest is like a mortgage versus borrowing $10. Like, uh, for example, if you're going to buy a house, you have to go to the bank, you have to submit some paper, they have to agree, they have to give you the loan, you go to make the documents and you follow some certain steps and you cannot fail one step in the middle or the communication would fail. But rest, yeah, I gave you $10, at any time you can give me five you can the other day you can invite me for a coffee for five dollar it's it's not like constraint you can do the action in different order because they are stateful and they doesn't have follow specific you know order to make the requests or the functionality <clears throat> so what i have to understand about http and the payload what I, I need to understand is that the, the, the response code is very important, the payload and how the structure of the payload is. So let's look at HTTP header and response code that we have to take care of. This is very, this information always hidden from user, but all the tools now they can show you. You can use live header, postman, curl. You can just see, say, show the headers and everything so you'll understand because based on that, I would like to, uh, you know, uh, act upon the payload like content type, very important status code, and the the um, the uh, the status content type and the media type that describe the actual structure of the payload and how things works together. The content type identify the type of the payload: JSON, XML, binary, whatever it is. So you can act upon and the status definitely, you know, uh, indicate either successful or fail. So please, HTTP response code classes that we just need to take care of, 100s, 200s, 300s, 400s, not all of them, and 500s, not all of them only. You have to be unique. You have to be understandable and follow <clears throat> the standard. So the client will usually, you know, success means 200. So you don't invent, please don't invent your codes unless you need same like programming don't create exceptions unless you really need it for your business there is a bunch of exceptions the gdk came for example in java so you try to reuse them and unify them and don't try to create a bunch of exceptions to define certain something you can have messages uh for 200s we use 200 for 
201 for created using was post, 202 that I accepted your request and it's for processing like check out or something like this and 204 if I search and there is no content, return it back. So 300 is only when I'm migrating or making maintenance. So just introduce only two of those. Those are more than enough, 400. I use bad requests if you are trying to bad URI and authentication error forbidden and not found for URI, not for data, because this is sometimes confusing. We, know, we use 204 for not data, no content or no data found. Finally, <clears throat> 500 actually is general uh, for uh, system errors. So we can customize it one exception and that's it. Uh, give a proper response code. Response code are great, yes, but please do not create your own, please. <clears throat> Those are what we need to know. Let's go to the most important part that says, I am developing actually RESTful API, not just REST or some URLs that return payload because RESTful API has to confirm with those constraints. So the REST constraint are client, they should be client server. So they are independent, stateless. They doesn't maintain any states cacheable as much as you can for performance. They serve, if you're adding some functionality, they are not affected layer systems and code and demand, this is optional one and the most important and hardest one in uniform interface. <clears throat> Line server, what does it mean? Like web browser and web server. They are, they should interact despite their location. So you are using names, not using IBs. By separating the two, we can vary. I can communicate with many things in different, in different geographical location because I'm depending on the names, not depending on the, uh, uh, you know, um, the, the actual IDs. And this is a problem we always face, like your back end engineer talking to a database and they always give you like ID. And when they change the ID, you find like replication fails. And oh man, please ask him to give you a domain name instead of ID. So this is definitely serve the scalability and reliability. This is very important. If you are front-end engineer, mobile application, talking to your REST API, speak uh, uh, through, um, you know, naming domain names, not IB at all. This should be stateless, definitely. Stateless API, each request stand on its own. There is no sequence. You can apply it at any time. Request can be processed in any order. This is very important because sometimes they will do. And as you have seen in our example, we can, yeah, he can obtain the status. Yeah, I have one API to do this. So in, in some specific orders, I can accomplish the specific tasks. So they, they are not going, they, are, they shouldn't depend on each other. Because this is why they should be status. Secondly, you don't have to worry about migration or firing another instance because you don't maintain status about the security. We use GWT or status less security tokens to identify this, to, uh, to solve this problem. It's not like normal application that has a state for, uh, you know, the, the user and session. So something like this, and when you have, uh, talking about the security, you always add the authorization token or in the header request header, you have this uh, beer uh, and adding the token for you. So it's stateless. Why stateless? Because flexibility, indeed stability, you don't have to maintain memory and people, uh, states and data <clears throat> and reliability. So I can more and more extend my API without having any problems. <clears throat> Excuse me guys, my voice. <clears throat> Another constraint, caching, cacheability. This is very important, cacheable APIs. Each message should describe whether it's cacheable or not. Improves definitely the network and application usages and make the system more reliable and scalable because there is no more, you know, requests will hit your server and backend unless it's going to be cacheable, will be served immediately. So be aware that I told you before, git, put, and delete should be idempotent or safe means whenever you apply the same action, it doesn't change your back resources. The word safe means that a given HTTP method is invoked multiple times over the resource state on the server will remain unchanged. Yes, delete is the most easiest. When you submit, when you delete something, even if you say, I would like to delete this, you can always reply 200 success. I already deleted. 
for putting the same data means updating the same data again and again and again, it doesn't change. It changed the first time and always you can say, I already requested. You don't have to process the request. If it's like the same data, you can say like 200, it's already updated, thank you. And getting definitely, you don't change, you get data. But for post, it's dangerous because post always meant for creation or processing time, something. You cannot, you have to wait for the process, then return the response. It cannot be ID important, it's not safe. So you have to check about the request for posts, if they are redundant or not, because they are going to create duplicate requests or something like this. So we usually use e-tags because e-tags are simple and awesome and built for cache signaling, uh, generated also for individual requests sent in the headers and the browser will save them and make sure that they are not changing based on the hash and compare to see if anything has changed available via head verb and you can check about it here. How it looked like, it looked like this. So if you have curling API GitHub, you will find e tag, the third yellow line hashed like this. If this hash change mean, means this content changed, then the browser will invalidate the cache and cache the new uh, request. So rest constraint, the other three is layered systems. So layered systems mean that I developed my application that uh, interact with layers as like, don't count on the client interacting directly with that. So you have API gateway, you have, you know, security authorization system before or after, it doesn't matter. Finally, you are behind some layers that protect you or adding functionality, um, JZipping functionality, you know, compression, all of this, it doesn't affect your API. So don't give the, the, the customer the final endpoint because if you change the API, finally you have to take care of this. So we use this on what every single day, it adds silent invisible dependencies. And uh, a wide layer system, because it's allowing between system to add and remove functionality, allow load balancers, caching, logging, authorization, et cetera, to be in my system. The, this is nightmare sometimes, but it happens because it's adding code and demand. And uh, you know, a request does not retrieve the resources, but also the code act up in it. This is sometimes, oh, how can I add? I can allow to download third party code. This is, this is a big problem. We don't have to know or understand the code, just how to run it and allow for the flexibility and upgradability. And it's, yes, it's a nightmare, but Gmail does this. Mm. So you can find new functionality added and you have the new functionality and trends and everything. So yes, but it's optional. You don't have to take care. Final and latest, the most important uniform, what does it mean? It should be present in every API, which is the most complex, but most powerful at all. And uniform interface principle are identification of the request, manipulation of the resources through this representation, self-descriptive messages for documentation and hate use. So identification means, as I told you, generally we use noun and action and then identification of this specific ID but don't require like slash nouns, don't compose any other form of URI, just use the resource. And then you get something specific from the resource or you are providing an action, specific action up in that resource for a specific or for a specific resource. So those are the general agreed open. So the customer always know the form of URI. Secondly, manipulation means that I have to uh, you know, what? how much API that I can use, this is for 12 or for APIs. They have just three APIs using Git for all, getting recording, getting SMSs, calls, and you have posts, you can do only for calls and SMSs, put is not allowed because you cannot edit and delete only for recording and that's it. So it's very powerful and unique. And also it requires many validation and revisiting to reach this, but here's the documentation, very simple. Self-descriptive, yes, this is, as I told you, if that resource is cacheable, have the process itself and have the request the next resource. Sometimes it comes, uh, you know, this is um, this is like an, an API or when you give it as a, a contract, this is very important. Finally, hate use, I'm not going to explain it, you can write it, hate use means how can I provide the next functionality for the customer discoverability without the asking for me, like, if I'm requesting an account and then I can return some link as a, re a relation, like you can also in that account, when you ask, you can deposit, you can withdraw, you can transfer, you can close the account. And sometimes in the future, if I have more 
functionality I just can link add the link and then the deliver, developer discovering my API oh they have a new functionality I don't have to go over their functionality or I, as a developer developing this API I have to don't have to give like bitches in order to know hi guys here's a new requirement you can get discoverability something like this for the API from GitHub. So those are the most important parts, risk constraint, the process, and by this, we are reaching our goal to have a successful API design and restful API. So I think that we are almost...